Bunny and Edward. Thanks. Speaker. Cool. Go ahead and get started. Let's see. Can anybody hear me? <laughs> great, great, great. This is the first time that I've uh, given an actual academic talk. Uh, I've got a little bit of an echo uh, that I'm trying to deal with, so please bear with me on that. Uh, this is this is exciting. Um, one of the interesting things about Corey's talk, uh, it, it's, it's great to follow him up, is that he brought up an idea that is great for this forum because it's something we don't talk enough about, which is the idea that laws are actually a weak guarantee of outcome. We outlaw murder, we outlaw theft, they still happen. Uh, we outlaw many other behaviors, they still happen. Uh, this is not to say they're bad, this is not to say we don't want any rules, but there are better guarantees, and we should consider when they are appropriate, uh, and when they in fact can provide a, a greater enforcement uh, for individual or human rights uh, than the actual laws or policies themselves uh, left naked and sort of alone in the world. Uh, so let's, let's get started with the talk. A uh, quick introduction. Um, my name is Edward Snowden. I'm the director of the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, some years ago, I told the truth uh, about a matter of public importance. And as a result, uh, a warrant was issued for my arrest and I'm no longer able to travel freely. Uh, but today is a great example of uh, why that doesn't mean exactly what it once did. And because of that, I'd like to thank very much uh, MIT for organizing this conference uh, and the opportunity to speak with everybody here today. Uh, for journalists in the audience, that's not a small thing. I should point out that they deserve credit for living up to that commitment to knowledge. Uh, now, no organization is perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. Uh, but that is quite a risk. And this may be the first time an American exile has been able to present original research at an American university. Uh, so it, it's hard to imagine, I would say, a, a more apt platform for this talk than the Forbidden Research Conference. But that's enough preamble. Um, the guiding theme uh, of many of the talks today, I think, uh, is that law is no substitute for conscience. Our investigation uh, regards countering what we're calling lawful abuses of digital surveillance. Lawful abuse, right? What, what is that? Uh, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It seems like it might be a contradiction in terms. Uh, when I announced the talk on Twitter, somebody immediately was like, lawful, uh, lawful abuse is not a contradiction. Uh, but if you think about it for, for just a moment, it might seem to be a little bit more clear. Uh, after all, uh, the legality of a thing is quite distinct from the morality of it. Now, I claim no exceptional uh, expertise on any of this, but having worked at both the NSA and the CIA, I do know a little bit uh, about what I would consider to be lawful abuses. Uh, after all, mass surveillance was argued to be constitutional, uh, and yet the courts found very differently, despite the fact uh, that it was hidden and was occurring for more than a decade. Uh, a lawful abuse is something that I would define as an immoral or improper activity perpetuated or justified under a shelter of law. Can you think of an example of that? I mean, it doesn't take long to look back in history and find them, I think. But what about things that are more recent? Uh, mass surveillance, of course, is the example that's nearest to my own experience. But let's set that aside. What about torture? The Bush administration aggressively argued that torture could be legalized. What about indefinite detention? right, uh, the internment of individuals for years without access to trial or due process, extrajudicial killing, uh, the targeted assassination of known individuals far from any war zone, uh, often by drone in today's world. Now, they may be criminals. Uh, they may be uh, even people who are armed combatants in many cases, but not all. Uh, and the fact that these things are changing often in secret, often without the public's awareness or their knowledge or consent should be disturbing. Uh, given that there are sort of covert legal protections for these engagements. Now, such abuses aren't limited strictly uh, to national security. And that's important, right? Because we don't want this to entirely be uh, this big paradigm of uh, politics between sort of doves and hawks. Segregation, 
slavery, uh, genocides, these have all been perpetuated under frameworks that said they were lawful as long as you abided by the regulations uh, that are sort of managing those activities. A lawful abuse of surveillance could also be more difficult to spot, not something that's as obvious. How about a restriction on who and how you can love someone that's enforced by violence? Or something as simple as an intentional tax loophole or discrimination? Lawful abuse. So we've defined the term, right? But what is the actual problem? Well, advances in the quality of our technology combined with a retreat in the quality of our legal frameworks have created a paradigm in which our daily activities produce an endless wealth of records uh, which can and are uh, being used to do harm to individuals, including those who have themselves done no wrong. If you have a phone in your pocket that's turned on, a long-lived record of your movements has been created. Uh, as a result of the way the cell phone network functions, your device are constantly shouting uh, into the air by means of radio signals, a unique identity, right, uh, that sort of validates you to the phone company. Uh, and this unique identity is not only saved by that phone company, but it can also be observed as it travels over the air by independent, even more dangerous third parties. Now, due to the proliferation of sort of an ancient third party doctrine style interpretation of law, uh, even the most predatory and unethical data collection regimes are often entirely legal. Uh, and effectively, what this means is that if you have a device, you have a dossier. Uh, they may not be reading it, they may not be using it, but it's out there. Now, why should we care? Uh, even if uh, there are these comprehensive records being created about your private activities, right? Uh, where you are, who you went with, uh, how long you were there, uh, did you meet with anyone, so on and so forth, uh, were any purchases made, any sort of uh, electronic activity record when these things are aggregated. I can think of 1,070 reasons why it matters. According to the figures of the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, more than 1,070 journalists or media workers have been killed or gone missing since January of 2005. Uh, and this is something that might not be as intuitive as you might expect. People go, well, we've had a lot of wars going on. Surely it's combat related. These are combat deaths. But when you look at these same figures, murder is actually a more common cause of death than combat. Uh, and amongst this number, politics was a more common news beat than war correspondence. Now, why is this? It's because one good journalist in the right place at the right time can change history. One good journalist can move the needle in the context of an election. Uh, one well-placed journalist can influence the outcome of a war. This makes them a target. And increasingly, the tools of their trade are being used against them. Our technology is beginning to betray us, not just as individuals, uh, but as classes of workers, particularly those who are putting a lot on the line at risk for the public interest. Uh, speaking specifically here about journalists who, by virtue of their trade, uh, rely upon communication in their daily work. And unfortunately, uh, German journalists are beginning to be targeted uh, on the basis of specifically those communications. A single mistake can have a major impact. Uh, a single mistake can result in a detention as was the case in the case of uh, David Miranda, uh, who was passing through London Heathrow, actually, in the reporting that was related to me and my archive of material that was passed to journalists. Uh, his journalistic materials were seized by the British government. Uh, and this was after they intercepted communications regarding his plans to travel through their country. But it can also result in far, far worse, the detention. In the Syrian conflict, uh, the Assad regime began shelling the civilian city of Homs uh, to an extent that almost all foreign journalists were forced to flee. Uh, now, the government stopped accrediting journalists, uh, and those who were accredited and were reporting their locations uh, were being harassed, they were being beaten, they were being disappeared. Uh, so only a handful remained, including a few who actually headed to this city, particularly to the uh, Baba Amr district. 
uh, to document the abuses that were being visited upon the population there. Now, typically, uh, in such circumstances, uh, a journalist working in these kind of dangerous conditions wouldn't file their reports until after they had left the conflict area uh, because they don't want to invite any kind of reprisal. It is dangerous. But what happens when you can't wait? What happens when there are things that a, a government uh, is sort of arguing aren't happening and in fact are happening? The Syrian government at the time uh, said, of course, that they weren't targeting civilians. Civilians weren't being impacted. Uh, these were enemy combatants. Uh, and it's important to understand these lawful abuses of activities uh, happen in many different places. And you might be going, oh, well, this isn't lawful. Surely this isn't lawful. And of course, by an international law context, you're absolutely right. Uh, by any sort of meaningful interpretation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this is uh, a human rights violation. It is a war crime. But domestic laws are a hell of a thing. And you've got to remember that while you might trust American courts, China has courts, Russia has courts, North Korea has courts, Syria has courts. Uh, they have lawyers, they have offices of general counsel who create policies to oversee and regulate these kind of activities and create frameworks to justify whatever it is that the institutions of power actually want to do. Now, in this moment, in that Syrian city of Homs, uh, the government was lying in a way that actually affected international relations. They were saying this was a justified offensive uh, against enemy forces, and yet there was a reporter there by the name of Marie Colvin uh, who infiltrated the city. She actually crawled in, I believe, through a tunnel uh, in the dark. Uh, had to climb stone walls and things like that. Uh, they couldn't speak because they were afraid about being fired upon. Uh, and she said this was not the case. Uh, she actually filed this report live, despite the fact uh, that they were worried that there might be some kind of government reprisal. Uh, she spoke four times to four different news agencies on a single day, and they sounded something like this. I'm at ground zero, and I'm seeing what is being hit. Civilian buildings are being hit. I'm on a street that has the houses on this street have been hit, um, and including the one I'm in and lost the top floor last week. There, there are only civilian houses here. Secondly, the civilians can't leave. Um, you know, you may say, well, if it's so bad, why are they staying there? The Syrians are not allowing civilians to leave. Anyone who gets on the street, if they're not hit by a shell, they're sniped. There's snipers all around Bab al Amr on the high buildings. Um, I, I think the sickening thing is the complete merciless nature of, of this bombing, um, whether or not uh, what is the target, they are hitting civilian buildings absolutely mercilessly and without caring. Now, this might sound like just another war story, but the next day, the makeshift media center that she was operating from, the one where the building, uh, the top floor had been hit the week before, was repeatedly and precisely shelled by the Syrian army. She died as a result of this shelling, uh, as did a French uh, journalist. And the photographer that she was working with was also wounded. And it wasn't until sometime later that we found, based on Lebanese signals intelligence collection uh, and uh, some other reporting, that the Syrian army had actually given the order to specifically target journalists who were breaking sort of a news blackout in this organization. But how did they discover her? How did they know where to aim their shells? Well, according to reporting that occurred uh, just, uh, just this week, actually, there was, uh, or the week prior, I believe, uh, her family has filed a lawsuit against the Syrian government. And they have evidence alleging that the radio frequency emissions of her communications that she used to file those news reports were intercepted by the Syrian army. They used direction finding capabilities to track and locate uh, sort of this illegal, unlawful media center and then walk artillery fire toward it. Uh, now walking artillery fire is uh, sort of how you re-aim artillery when it falls short or when it goes far of where you're actually trying to hit. You have a spotter somewhere in the city who goes, oh, you didn't quite hit the media center, you hit the hospital next door. Move it a little bit to the right, a little bit to the right. And they heard these shells coming. By the time the second shell hit, uh, they knew they were in trouble. This happened at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, she was going to grab her shoes because uh, as is custom in the region, you have to enter the house uh, with bare feet. Uh, and she was caught by a shell and, and killed at that point. Now, there's a question here 
uh, among many policy officials where they go, uh, was this legal? What processes do we use to sort of remediate these kind of threats uh, when these things happen? What happens when the policies fail? Uh, and of course, this is an argument that the Syrian government itself uh, would say is misunderstood. These were actually attacks that were uh, occurring by terrorists or whatever, or if we did these operations, they were lawful. But there's a larger question of, does it matter? Does it matter whether it was authorized by law or not? Was this a moral action, regardless of whether it was lawful or unlawful? And are these kind of things preventable? Can we enforce some stronger guarantee of the kind of locational indicators of our activities that we're putting out there? Perhaps in the case of Marie Colvin, we could not. But what about the case of a future journalist? What about a journalist who has to meet with source in a denied area, and they don't want their phone to be shouting into the air, to be giving up some kind of locational indicator uh, of their movements. Uh, this is an area that is the focus of our research. Can we detect if the phone starts breaking the rules? And for example, if you turn off uh, your, your Wi-Fi indicator, you put your phone in airplane mode, you try to turn off GPS, you get a little icon that lights up and says, I'm off. But is that actually the case? Can you trust the device? What if the device has been hacked? What if something else is going on? So we wanted to investigate, can we use these same devices that are so frequently used against us as a kind of canary to detect these new targeted attempts for uh, monitoring communications, not just based on the emanations that go out on our phone, but malware attacks, intentional efforts to compromise the phone. For example, uh, there was an Argentinian prosecutor uh, who, after he was murdered, uh, when he was investigating whether the state uh, had been engaged in uh, serious violations of law, they recovered a malware sample from his phone. Uh, now, that malware sample did not match the operating system of his phone, uh, so it was not responsible in that case, but it was clear that an attempt had been made to compromise his devices and use them against him. Uh, this same malware was found targeting other activists, other journalists, other sort of lawyers uh, in the Latin American region. If we can start to use devices, again, as a kind of canary to identify when these phones have been compromised, and we're able to get these to a targeted class of individuals, such as journalists, such as human rights workers, that can detect that these phones are breaking the rules, they're acting in unexpected ways, what we can do is we can begin uh, affecting the risk calculation of the offensive actors in these cases. The NSA, for example, is very nervous about getting caught red-handed. They don't want to risk the political impact of being seen in targeted groups like journalists, like American lawyers, despite the fact that they have been engaged in such operations. Uh, in rare cases, it's not their meat and potatoes, but it does happen. Uh, other governments are not so careful, but if we can create a track record uh, of compromise, if we can create a track record of uh, unlawful or unethical activity, we can begin creating a framework uh, to overturn the culture of impunity uh, that affects so many of these lost journalists' lives. In those uh, 1,070 cases of dead journalists uh, or the disappeared, impunity was the most common outcome. But I want to make it clear here that the idea is not just to protect an individual journalist's phone, which is a worthy cause, uh, but to, again, increase the cost of engaging in these kind of activities, engage in the cost of carrying out lawful abuses of digital surveillance. Uh, and without sort of uh, belaboring the point here, let's go to the actual technical uh, side of this and, and talk about what we've actually done. Uh, Bunny, let's talk about initial results. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for uh, setting all that up, Ed, and uh, motivating the background for uh, why we're trying to do what we're trying to do. Um, when we started out the project, the basic challenge that was outlined is how do we take a venue where um, you know, reporters meet with sources and secure it against uh, state-level adversaries? Um, there's a lot of people who are smarter than me who are working extremely hard to turn your smartphones into mini cyber fortresses. Uh, the problem is, is that phones are a very large, complicated attack surface. There's, you have email, you have web, you have messaging, you have the ability to install apps. Trying to secure this against a state-level adversary is very challenging, um, just like trying to create a, a city that's 
robust against a land, sea, and air attack. Uh, but turn over the phone and you look on the back side, this is a surface that's much simpler and something that you know, I feel more comfortable with as a hardware guy. And there's only two really notable features on the back of the antennae. Right? Those form sort of a choke point that we can look at to see if anything's going in or out of the device. And so uh, you know, if you want to go ahead and make sure that uh, your phone isn't sending signals, you say, well, why don't we just go ahead and put in airplane mode? Turns out the question is, is can you trust the gatekeeper? Can you trust the UI? Um, if you go to the Apple website and you read the little thing about airplane mode, it, it actually says here that if you have a device with OS, um, uh, since iOS 8.2, airplane mode does not turn off GPS. In fact, when you have your, when your device in airplane mode, the GPS is, is constantly on and can be pinged. Uh, without any indication on the UI at all. And that's just, that's a, that's a policy that they have for the phones. You can also turn on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in airplane mode accidentally or intentionally. Um, and that little icon is still there making you think that your device shouldn't be receiving or transmitting radio signals. Um, so the question is, is, is there a way we can independently monitor that gate, right? Can we install effectively a closed circuit TV camera of our own design, of our own construction and, and our own installation to, to, to sort of audit and verify that this is, uh, this is actually happening. Uh, so the goal, of, uh, you know, the technical goal here is to make sure that the radios are really off. We want to look at the cellular modem, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, and NFC, Apple Pay. Uh, it's a technique that we call direct introspection. And we have a set of eight principles that we uh, sort of came together for, uh, uh, came up with for this project um, uh, that we use to evaluate different approaches. Uh, First is that we want to make sure that uh, whatever you come up with is completely open source and inspectable. You don't have to trust us uh, or what we say. Second is uh, we want to create a partition execution environment for the introspection engine. Uh, it's, you can think of the thing we're doing as like a designated driver for the phone. The phone may be given you know, a spike drink and unable to assess its, assess its own security status. So we have a completely separated, physically separated execution environment um, uh, for, for evaluating the, uh, the signals. Um, we also want to make sure that the proper operation is field verifiable. Um, it, you need to guard against a hardware failure. So if the cable falls out that's doing the introspection, that's really bad. You want to be able to check that that's still there. Um, and you also want to guard against uh, potential so-called evil made attacks. Um, it's also want to make sure that it's difficult to, to trigger a false positive. If the thing's always warning you that your phone is you know, going off and it's actually not true, you're going to start ignoring the warnings. Um, and, this, and this criteria made us rule out a bunch of sort of more passive uh, approaches, like sort of sensing the antennas uh, you know, through the RF emanations. Because if you happen to walk by a very strong emitter, like a, a, a Wi-Fi access point or something, your phone would trip and you would stop uh, ignoring the alarms. Um, we also want to make sure it's difficult to induce false negatives. We don't necessarily, uh, you know, it's quite possible, for example, a system vendor can be compelled to push an update to your phone uh, and through a, you know, a completely secure mechanism. And so you know, even, even you know, the system vendor can go ahead and put holes in the walls that you thought um, uh, was once you know, intact. Um, we also want to avoid leaving a signature that's easy to profile. Um, so we don't want to have something where someone says, okay, let's look for people who have introspection engines in their phone and target those guys because they have something to hide. So we have to create something that's essentially are, are very you know, strongly correlated at the harder level with the activation of the radios. These are signals which um, even a firmware update or some other kind of a remote modification to the phone can't bypass. So they're, 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 they're a very strong indicator of, of radioactivity. Um, we came up with a list of candidates that, that are here. I'm not gonna go through all of them in detail for lack of time, but if you're interested, actually there's a blog post live on PubPub now. Um, here it's uh, uh, goo.gl slash y. Uh, number zero F S letter L U, um, and I go through the, the details of um, you know what the signals are while we while we chose them and what we plan to doing. But the basic idea is, if you see these wires wiggle and you think your phone is in airplane mode, there's a problem. Your you know, something is turning on the radios in that mode, and you know you've and your your phone has been compromised. Um, so in terms of sort of next steps, uh, of course, you know, we actually need to develop the hardware. Uh, we don't expect journalists to carry on oscilloscopes and hack their phones and so on and so forth. Um, and, the, and the basic approach, you know, that we're sort of, this is a purely a concept rendering, but the idea is to try to create like a battery case style um, add-on to the back of a phone which contains the introspection engine. It has its own UI because you can't trust the UI in the front of the phone. You have input and output to that device. 
Um, and there's a, there's a cable that goes between um, the, uh, the introspection engine of the phone through, this, through the SIM card port on the iPhone 6. So the solution here is specific to the iPhone 6, but uh, uh, the technique should be extendable to other makes and models of phones. That's basically it for, for our presentation. So thanks a bunch, Ed, for uh, setting this up. And uh, I look forward to working on this. Oh, he, he's got it. My pleasure. It's, it's been amazing. I say. If I could just say one, uh, one thing real quick for the room, uh, as uh, this was my first academic collaboration, uh, having Bunny as your, uh, your primary collaborator on the very first time uh, is amazing. He is one of the individuals uh, whose competence gives people imposter syndrome. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my best uh, to, to live up to it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Ed.